The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of one God, creator, sustainer, and redeemer. Some of you might be aware that once we get into the summer months, our lectionary offers us two choices of the Old Testament lesson in the psalm. Imagine my shock when I realized I had mistakenly prepared a sermon on the Old Testament lesson you did not hear. Once I recovered from the adrenaline coursing through my body, I thought, what if this is the sermon that needs to be heard? At any rate, it is the sermon you're going to hear. <laughs> so the option for today, other than Amos, is the iconic story from Genesis in which Abraham and Sarah entertain some very special visitors. Here's how it goes. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. So that's where the passage for today ends. But just to refresh your memory, Sarah and Abraham are 90 years old. So providing Abraham with descendants has been Sarah's desire and mission forever. But she is way past childbearing years. So when she laughs at the irony of this pronouncement, one of the visitors retorts, why do you laugh? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And before long, Sarah becomes pregnant, Isaac is born, and Abraham's descendants eventually, as God promised, number the stars. So we get this picture of overflowing hospitality on Abraham's part. They probably don't get too many visitors in the middle of the desert. 
And the fact that he sort of runs out to them, bows down before them, begs them to stop and refresh themselves, provides them with the finest food and treatment he has to offer. And miraculous things occur as a result of this chance interaction. There's been much speculation about the nature of the visitors. They seem like normal humans. Although in the very first verse, we're told the Lord, the God of Israel, appeared to Abraham. So this blurring of the human and the divine has often characterized them to be angels. Certainly, an adage we could draw out of this passage is be kind, be welcoming, be hospitable to everyone you encounter, for those strangers you meet just might be angels. We really never know whose life we're affecting. One Sunday back in 2014 at my former church, I delivered a sermon titled, Let Your Heart Speak. It was the custom there to title sermons. I began talking about cellular memory. So that's the memory that's in each of our cells, in each of our organs. And I was focusing on the heart. There's lots of research that's been done on heart transplant patients where personality traits, proclivities, food preferences from the donor end up in the recipient of the new heart. It's fascinating. And there's lots of stories to support it. You can Google cellular memory when you have a moment. Anyway, so I used this information to kind of set up talking about the presence of God speaking in and through our hearts. But about 10 days later, I received an email, which I will read to you in part. Reverend Gillespie, I attended your service on October 26th, and I heard your sermon, Let Your Heart Speak. My cousin is a member of your church, and my family just happened to be in town visiting. On April 13th, 2014, so that's the same year, right? So this is only six months later. My father and son were murdered in Overland Park, Kansas, at the Jewish Community Center by a man professing hate towards Jews. We are not Jewish. They were there for my son, Reet, to audition for an event. You can Google me or Reet Underwood and read all about us. My point of writing you is to inform you that I plagiarized your sermon to a degree several days later. My son was able to be an organ and tissue donor the day he died. A local charity called Gift of Life hosts an annual rally for high school students as an introduction and call to action for high school students to become organ donors. I was the closer for the rally. Over the past month, I'd been formulating how I would present my story to them, but all I had was my story. I didn't have a good idea of what to weave in and help to keep them and me from crying through the whole presentation. Then I attended your service. My cousin and I just grinned at each other when you began. I seem to be given messages from God in many places and by many people. I was supposed to be with you on Sunday, and your message was certainly meant for me. You and I got a standing ovation from 300 high school students in the Kansas City metro area. Thank you for what you do. You make a difference. Blessings, Mindy Corporan. Needless to say, I was stunned. I was heartbroken for her, incredulous that she just happened to be there, so thrilled that she wrote me, like I never even needed to know that that had happened, but she took the time to sit down and communicate with me. And when I wrote her back, and asked her permission to share her email with others, her response was, use it in any way that furthers God's mercy and justice. 
We have no idea whose lives we are affecting at any given moment. I was just doing my job on an ordinary Sunday. Abraham and Sarah were just practicing hospitality. That's a traditional and expected Middle Eastern custom, even if Abraham was especially eager to serve. But for me, the powerful thing about this passage is the idea of a practice, the practice of hospitality, something you do over and over again to get better at it. I heard the most inspiring interview this week from the radio show called On Being with Krista Tippett. She was interviewing the writer, activist, and community organizer, Adrienne Marie Brown. She is an amazing thinker. There was a lot that just blew my mind, but I especially loved what she had to say about practice, about being intentional about what we practice. She said, I always tell people, you are always practicing things. It's not like you go from not practicing to practicing. But are you practicing things on purpose? Are you practicing things you want to practice? Or are you practicing what somebody has told you to practice? Somebody's told you that this is the right way to do stuff. Once you start practicing on purpose, she says, then you can actually practice liberation and justice and freedom. And I think you begin to have this contentment that comes from practice. She added, I know that I won't see total liberation in my lifetime, but I also feel very satisfied with how I'm practicing liberation every single day and in every relationship. I found this so helpful. It feels so overwhelming, this world we're living in. How can we possibly affect change in this complicated world, in this complicated time? Well, you start with relationships, the relationships around you. We start with seeing God in each and every person we meet. And we start by practicing hospitality with them, no matter who they might be, and no matter what that might look like, right? Maybe it's just looking every stranger you meet in the eye and smiling. You never know whose life you might be touching. So I wonder, what are you practicing? Is it something you want to practice? What's happening in your relationships? Are you being the person you want to be in the encounters you have with people every day? It seems small, but it can change your life. And it can change the lives of the strangers around you. You never know whose life you are affecting at any given moment. So I invite each of us, me too, to commit ourselves to this practice of hospitality, serving God in one another, and especially the strangers in our lives. They just might be angels.